All right, Clinton. You called down the thunder, well now you got it. You see that? It says United please. States Marshal. Why? Please don't kill me, please. please. Take a good look at him, Mike. Because that's how you're going to end up. The cowboys are finished, you understand me? I see a red sash, I kill a man wearing it. So run, you cur. Uh, run! Tell all the other curs the line's coming! You tell them I'm coming! And hell's coming with me, you hear? Hell's coming with me! It is 2024, and I come back to you with joyful tidings. The American Society of Magical Negroes has been oblivion yeeted from theaters after just three weeks, officially ending its domestic theatrical run with a whopping box office tally of $2.5 million after being projected to earn more than $3 million in its opening weekend alone. The official trailer on YouTube has over 7.2 million views with only 10,000 likes and somewhere around 150,000 dislikes based on that handy Chrome extension that YouTube really doesn't want you to know about. While the film's budget remains one of Hollywood's most closely guarded secrets, we can now safely predict that the American Society of Magical Negroes, which the director and lead actor have confirmed was specifically given that name so that white people would be unable to utter it out loud, will be one of the greatest box office flops of all time. It turns out that people of all colors, backgrounds, orientations, cultures, and faiths don't actually like racists who make racist movies that tell regular people they're all a bunch of racists. And that is how the magic of cinema can unite a divided world. Burn in box office hell, the American Society of Magical Negroes. Here's a more likable bottle blonde teaching you how to shuffle step. However, I will emphasize that no matter how demonic the themes and ideologies of the movie were, its greatest sin was actually continuing Hollywood's deluded trend of trying to make Justice Smith a thing. Hollywood, stop trying to make Justice Smith a thing, he's never going to be a thing. Did you ever see The Voyeurs? Sidney Sweeney plays a wide-eyed, innocent Canadian, and at one point you get to see her boobs for like five minutes straight. And even that couldn't save that movie from the participation of Justice Smith. You are just awful. You're one of the worst actors in the history of film. And I think that you need to go away. I already had Jake Johnson's Lowry from Jurassic World, who was actually funny and could have served the same role in the story, and they went with that. Why'd you have to make it personal? Alright, this is supposed to be a western. Let's talk about a far better form of justice. Hello, Canada, and the world at large. This is Lane from Canada. Westerns always make me nostalgic for days gone by. Days of tough lawmen, legendary gunfighters, wilderness explorers, pioneering families, desperados, Chinese guys in black pajamas starting opium cartels, and the constant threat from wandering tribes of Indians, back when Indians in movies were allowed to be fun before they were mandated in perpetuity to get all Marvel's Echo and the Killers of Flower Moon on us. Nowadays, if we want to experience an actual Indian threat, we have to tune into city council meetings in Bakersfield, California. Regardless of whether you elect people into office, they'll backstab you, they'll let you die, and for that reason, you guys want to criminalize us with metal detectors, but we'll see you at your house. We'll murder you. That's a huge bitch. Cause I don't wanna wind up dead or fall. Please, Mr. Custer. I don't wanna go. The times and seasons may change, but my love of pointless tangentials will not. The American West of the 19th century may have fallen out of favor in Hollywood after its heyday from the 1950s to 1970s, but it's still one of my favorite genres. And the unexpected side effect of westerns becoming more rare is that when they do come out, they're generally of better quality than the mass-produced, low-budget, pulpy spaghetti we used to see a lot more of. Of course, there are modern exceptions, since Hollywood is still Hollywood, so they're really determined to make soy-based gay cowboys a thing. But then Sam Elliott gets to take a sh** over the soy-based, angry lesbian directors who make gay westerns, which is pretty hilarious. But still, as a general rule, a western is always going to be your stamp time machine ticket back to an era of strong men, pioneering spirit, and even some of the last great treasure hunts, albeit without all the hassle of, you know, dying of tuberculosis or dysentery in your mid-30s. Welcome to Season 3 of Before Movies Sucked, and this is Tombstone. 
In the Arizona town of Tombstone, a wealth of silver deposits have caused an eruption in the populace as hundreds of miners and pioneers flock into the boom town. The townsfolk have a cautious coexistence with a gang of Texas outlaws known as the Cochise County Cowboys, who primarily rustle cattle from Mexico to sell as beef to the miners. However, as a beef-fed miner is a happy miner, the county sheriff, John Behan, and town marshal, Fred White, generally tolerate the raucous bound- <laughs> Hey, that's Harry Carey Jr. Did they? What was she? What do you want me to do, draw you a picture? Spell it out? Looking to cash in on the silver claims, former Dodge City lawman Wyatt Earp and his laudanum addicted concubine, is that the word? Do they still have concubines in the Old West? ex horrors whatever. Matty Blaylock. In Tucson, they meet Wyatt's brothers, Virgil and Morgan, and their wives, Allie and Louisa, also possibly ex whores And also Wyatt's invisible brother, Warren, presumably played by Patrick Swayze, who gets completely shafted out of his prominent role in the Earp Vendetta ride because the screenwriters wanted the focus to be on Wyatt and Doc once Virgil and Morgan were out of the picture. The reunited family travels to Tombstone, where they immediately survive an assassination attempt by Billy Bob Thornton, and coincidentally meet no less than seven other major players in the story, including the future love of Wyatt's life within the course of about four minutes. I love movies! In the old wild west, when people's heads was funny, the funniest head of all belonged to Kid Friendly. He'll kill you with kindness, he'll kill you with a grin. Wyatt's close friend Doc Holliday, a southern gentleman and former dentist who is slowly succumbing to tuberculosis and alcoholism, subsists by fleecing the town at the poker tables with his Hungarian ex whore slash possibly current whore, Big Nose Kate. <whistles> Meanwhile, the Earp brothers find profitable work as car dealers at a racist saloon called the Oriental that serves Chinese food, <coughs> but have a number of troubling encounters with the cowboys. Notable among these are boisterous gang leader Curly Bill Brocious, psychopathic gunman Johnny Ringo, and the thuggish, hard-drinking Clanton brothers Ike and Billy. Things take a darker turn one night when Curly Bill, high on opium, begins trying to shoot the moon out of the sky. Marshall White confronts him in front of the racist saloon called the Oriental that serves Chinese food, but is fatally shot while attempting to disarm him. Wyatt pistol whips Curly Bill, but ends up in a tense standoff with the Cowboys who demand Curly Bill's release until Virgil and Morgan intervene. The murder charges against Curly Bill are dropped due to a lack of willing witnesses, which particularly bothers Virgil, a Civil War veteran and former sheriff. He grows increasingly troubled by the rampant lawlessness that he witnesses on the streets, and is disgusted by Wyatt and Morgan's focus on enriching themselves while the townsfolk are suffering. Determined to restore order, he takes over White's job as town marshal, convinces Morgan to join in as deputy, and imposes a townwide ban on carrying firearms. Wyatt is furious and confides to Morgan that he still carries the guilt of the one man he was forced to kill during his previous years in law enforcement. Doc's health severely worsens as he refuses to give up his all-night gambling and drinking, leading to a violent outburst from Mike Clanton, which forces Virgil to pistol whip and arrest him. When the still drunk cowboy is released the next day, he and his brother Curson threaten the Earps and then brazenly return to town with several cowboy friends, including Johnny Barnes, Billy Claiborne, and the McLowry brothers, Tom and Frank, all of them armed. Virgil is fed up with the cowboy's blatant defiance of the town rules and decides that once and for all, I must teach them a very simple lesson. Stop breaking the law, Not willing to abandon his brothers to harm, Wyatt finally agrees to be deputized and Doc also demands to join the apprehension despite his general disdain for peace officers. Returning home, Wyatt stuns a drug-addled Maddie by wearing a deputy's badge and retrieving his personalized Colt Buntline special revolver with a 10-inch barrel, a widely accepted bit of Earp lore which historians now believe to be fictional since there is zero manufacturing or patent evidence to suggest that such a badass weapon ever existed before the 20th century. It's real in our hearts. Oh yeah, and then this happens! Oh my god. Clanton and the McLowry brothers dead, the Earps have now killed three cowboys, and the opening scene of the movie already established how pissed off Curly Bill got with their Mexican rurales because... 
Y'all killed two cowboys. On a fateful stormy night, Virgil leaves the racist saloon called the Oriental that serves Chinese food, but is double-barreled by a barely recognizable Paul Van Victor who appears to be wearing brown face to portray the half-blood Mexican Indian outlaw Florentino Cruz. Virgil's left arm is shattered and permanently maimed, but it's okay because it leads to one of the most touching and memorably badass lines in real-life Wild West history. Don't worry, Ellie, girl. I still got one good arm to hold you with. After the Earp women and Josephine Marcus barely survive an assassination attempt, and word reaches the Earps that their friend Mayor Clum has also been targeted, Wyatt tells Morgan that they need to flee Tombstone. Morgan furiously refuses to give in to the man's of thugs and leaves to calm himself by playing billiards. Wyatt is met by two of his friends, Turkey Creek Jack Johnson and Texas Jack Vermillion, along with a repentant cowboy named Sherman McMasters, who disgustedly renounces the cowboys for targeting innocent women. They pledge to give Wyatt and his family any help they need. was exceptionally scummy and cowardly. Here's a more likable psychopath demonstrating Newton's first law of physics. That's gotta hurt. Oh yeah, there's a love story in here with Wyatt and an actress that I completely skipped over. Anywho, the grieving Earp family prepares to abandon Tombstone for the safety of California, taking Morgan's casket with them to Tucson train station for burial. I want you to know it's over. rightfully gush about how great Val Kilmer was as Doc Holliday, but the late great Powers Booth does not get nearly enough love for his take on Curly Bill. <laughs> Based on the aforementioned three-body problem the Cowboys still have with the Earps, Curly Bill assigns Ike and a cowboy named Frank Stillwell to ambush the family at the train station, but Wyatt turns the ambush around. He kills Stillwell and sends a cowering Ike back to Tombstone with the message that Wyatt and his newly deputized band of U.S. Marshals are declaring open season on the Cowboys. In what is possibly cinema's single greatest revenge montage, Wyatt and Doc lead their posse on a cold-blooded rampage, killing dozens of Cowboys, although historical records indicate that the actual number was closer to, you know, three. Amongst the casualties of the prophesied pale horse is Curly Bill, whom Wyatt miraculously guns down in a furious gun battle, which has the unfortunate effect of elevating Johnny Ringo into leadership of the Cowboys. As Doc's condition rapidly worsens, Wyatt realizes that Sheriff Behan is in league with the Cowboys and has deputized many of them, including Ringo and Ike. Needing to rest their horses and find treatment for Doc, the posse seeks shelter with a powerful cattle rancher, Henry Hooker. Hey, that's Charlton Heston! The next day, the posse discovers that McMasters has been captured and murdered by the Cowboys, and the Cowboy envoy tells Wyatt that Ringo has challenged them to end their battle in single combat. Wyatt furiously agrees to the duel. But later in private, he tells the bed and Doc that he knows he is no match for the quick-draw skills of Ringo. As Wyatt resolutely sets out to meet his fate, Doc asks what it is like to wear a badge, and Wyatt gifts him his U.S. Marshal star. Ringo waits for Wyatt at a rendezvous point, but is startled to instead be met by Doc, who had been exaggerating his illness, and now claims to be a sworn federal marshal. Ringo, who had verbally sparred with Holiday before and seems to be intimidated by him, nonetheless agrees to the duel. charge of Wyatt Earp and his immortals.
Sometime after avenging himself on the cowboys, Wyatt visits Doc, who is dying in a sanatorium in Colorado. Doc tearfully tells Wyatt about how he's only ever in love once with a cousin who would later join a convent, breaking his heart and leading him to live recklessly. He urges Wyatt to marry Josephine and live a full life, never looking back at his painful past. Wyatt thanks Doc for his years of unshakable loyalty and leaves his friend to die in peace. Wyatt then finds Josephine in Denver, promising to love her until he dies, and the couple dance together in the snowy streets. Tombstone was released on Christmas Day of 1993, which can be a bit of a dumping ground for good movies that get overlooked at the end of the year, but it was still a box office hit, and few films can wear their subsequent cult status with more pride. Even the poster and VHS slipcover is an iconic image, no matter how hilariously bad the photoshopped guns are. Seriously, I know it was 1993, but did they paint those guns into their hands with a pencil crayon? Regardless, the movie has transcended the world of entertainment and worked its way into everything from geek culture, memes, clothing lines, and even political dialogue. She had a police department when she was there that, in fact, was abusing people's rights. Okay, so Biden sounds a little slow on the attack, right? So this is a damaging moment for Harris. But then, apparently, he, he deputizes Tulsi Gabbard. He went in the back room somewhere, he swore her in, and suddenly this turned into the, the entire revenge montage from Tombstone. There are plenty of classic westerns out there that are objectively better than Tombstone. Fair arguments could be made that the Dollars Trilogy, Unforgiven, Lonesome Dove, The Searchers, Shane, either version of True Grit, and countless other westerns are better than Tombstone. But I don't care about what's better, I care about what I end up rewatching the most. Critical assessments and award tallies don't even stack up against your own personal view count. That's what matters most. And I honestly believe the devil will get paper wrapped freezer burn before another western comes along that I will watch more than the once in a lifetime pairing of Kurt Russell and Val Kilmer. The film was originally developed as a vehicle for then superstar Kevin Costner because we're talking about early 90s Kevin Costner and not the next 20 years of Kevin Costner. In a nutshell, Costner wanted a me 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 movie rather than the ensemble cast of Tombstone, so he left the project to develop his own Wyatt Earp film, which was released six months after Tombstone, cost more than twice as much to make, lost all the money in the world, and is primarily remembered for being really, really boring. Now, I'm not saying that Costner would have been a detriment to Tombstone if he had sucked up his ego and stuck it out till the end, as I can honestly see him and Val Kilmer playing off each other pretty well. What I will say is that the addition of Kurt Russell to the cast was a definitive boon to the overall production, especially if Russell's later claim that he ghost-directed most of the film turned out to be true. In almost every other adaptation of Wyatt Earp's story, I always got the impression that Wyatt doesn't actually like Doc, but tolerates him for his usefulness in battle. Russell was the biggest advocate for changing this trend in Tombstone to depict Wyatt's real-life affection for the gunslinging dentist, who seems to have been much closer to Wyatt than even some of his brothers. Another consistent factor in most prior Wyatt Earp films was the building up of the famous gunfight at the OK Corral as the film's climax, but Russell and writer Kevin Jarry wisely insisted that the OK Corral was the beginning of Wyatt's troubles and not the end. Placing the OK Corral gunfight at the film's midpoint allowed them to focus the entire third act on the previously overlooked Earp Vendetta ride, which ended up including some of the most memorable moments in the film. End of the day, I don't know if Kurt Russell directed this movie, but if he did, he needs to direct another one. Don't let your former co-stars Mel Gibson and Sylvester Stallone have all the fun, Kurt. I don't think I'll let you arrest us today, Behan. In my review of The Rock, I mentioned how beyond the great lead actors, it also had one of the best supporting casts ever assembled for a film, but Tombstone is pretty darn close behind. They even had a soy-based gay cowboy before it was cool. Kurt Russell and Val Kilmer are one of the best team-ups in film history. Sam Elliott is always going to be the best tough cowboy in every movie he's in. And even the late Bill Paxton gets to continue his winning streak of playing cocky guy who learns hard truths and then dies, which he previously played in the Terminator, Alien, and Predator franchises. Hey, milk what works. Cowboy actors seem to be having more hammy fun than anybody, with great moments from Powers Booth as Curly Bill, Michael Bean as Ringo, Michael Rooker as McMasters, Thomas Hayden Church as Billy Clanton, and Stephen Lang, who would later claim that his secret to staying in character as the Laudashite Clanton was to be falling down drunk for most of the shoot. Which would also explain his suspiciously convincing alcohol-induced rosacea makeup. In some ways, the expansive cast even eclipses The Rock, as the movie is also one of the best examples of making every major character memorable, since Dutch and his rowdy bunch in Predator in 1987. Which also makes it even more polar opposite of Kevin Costner's Wyatt Earp to the point where I keep forgetting that freaking Gene Hackman and Dennis Quaid were even in that one. Skin that smoke wagon and see what happens. They call me Curly Bill Brosi. I'm what you might call the founder of the peace. That's not what he said, you ignorant wretch. Spanish is worse than their English. Right. 
loving man. You've been called. Oh, Susanna. Camp Town Races. Steven Stinkin' Boston. You don't step aside, we'll tear you apart. You die first, Ken. Your friends might get me in a rush, but not before I make your head into a canoe. You understand me? I walk around this town and look these people in the eye. It's just like someone slapping me in the face. These people are afraid to walk down the street, and I'm trying to make money off that like some vulture. Sister boy should have stuck around. The bugs, what? Oh, that smart talk about living, let live. There ain't no living, let live with bugs. Tell you, I see them on the street in Doc Holler. I'm gonna send them to hell on a shutter. You tell them that. A lot of cowboys coming around looking for trouble from here to Christmas. You wanna risk all that over a misdemeanor? Damn right, I'll risk it. They're breaking the law. You got some boys over there behind you. Got you a little crossfire. How you like that? <laughs> and hell's all with you. You gonna do something or just stand there and bleed? Of course, nobody gets more standouts than Val Kilmer. You would be amazed at how many of Doc's lines you can drop into everyday conversation, and everybody in the room will get the reference. 500. Must be a peach of a hand. Isn't that a daisy? You know, Ed, if I thought you weren't my friend, I just don't think I could bear it. Oh, Johnny, I apologize. I forgot you were there. You may go now. Very cosmopolitan. Satisfied? I stand corrected, Wyatt. You're an oak. You must be Ringo. Look, darling. Johnny Ringo. Maybe poker's just not your game, Wyatt. I know. Let's have a spelling contest. How about if I just ring your scurly down? <laughs> and you, music lover. You're next. <laughs> Drunk piano player. You're so drunk, you can't hit nothing. In fact, you're probably seeing double. I have two guns, one for each of you. I'm your huckleberry. Why, Johnny Ringo. You look like somebody just walked over your grave. And no review of Tombstone would be complete without a tip of the hat to score composer Bruce Broughton. If you don't get a volley of chills down your spine for the duration of the last ride of Wyatt Earp and his immortals, there may be something wrong with your central nervous system. Could this movie be made today? We're here to disarm you. Throw up your hands. Oh! Not what I want! Men being men and doing what men are supposed to do. Defenders of justice, protectors of family, shepherds of the innocent, the wrathful hand of God when necessary. You can act like a man! What's the matter with you? It's horrifying. I want to move and go places and never look back. Just have fun. Forever. This is the most freewheeling, liberated woman the state of Arizona ever saw prior to approximately the year 1974, and she's still unacceptable by modern standards on purely heteronormative grounds. Down with the patriarchy. Hey, there, sister boy! Hey, sister boy! Give me some! Give me, give me, give me! Hang on, Barnes! Ready. Set with me. The film's almost public demonstration of allyship to the XLGBLT community comes to us courtesy of a mass murderer. <laughs> Remember when Netflix got in trouble for listing their Jeffrey Dahmer series in the gay category because he was a gay cannibal who predominantly ate gay guys? We'll convert your children. Cookie! Um, um, um. Yeah, that's 100% Paul Ben Victor in Brownface. Hey, Johnny, what I'd mess can mean a sick horse is gonna get us, huh? It's quoting the Bible. Revelations. Behold, a pale horse. The man who sat on him was death. And hell followed with him. I've been reliably informed by the hosts of The View that everything in this prophecy is not indicative of the opening of the fourth seal of the Great Scroll during the time of Jacob's Trouble, but is actually the result of man-made climate change. The Holocaust isn't about race. No. No. I'm a woman, I like men. Lady, if Associate Supreme Court Justice Katanji Brown Jackson can't define what a woman is, you ain't got a prayer.
So are gender and sex two different things? Or it is man. Uh huh. Uh no. Uh huh. No. 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 That's my loving man. Have another one, my loving man. Hungarian cultural appropriation by a Polish actress. I can tell that she was a born Hungarian. That's my loving man. Have another one, my loving man. Objectively unattractive Hungarian prostitute appropriation by an objectively hot actress. Stop stealing roles from ugly Hungarian women, Joanna Pakula. You're only allowed to play Polish roles. The first Polish Christmas dish I bring to the party. You're damn right I'll risk it. They're breaking the law. But did they steal more than $950 worth of merchandise within a 24-hour period from a Walgreens? If not, then Virgil's actually the one responsible the next time BLM Antifa burns down a Walgreens which mainstream media sources are quite confident will occur within the upcoming 2024 election cycle as evidenced by the top five headlines that pop up if you search for the name Dexter Reed, all of which conspicuously fail to mention that he was only shot by the police after he fired an illegal handgun multiple times at point-blank range at a black female police officer. And killer cops must be prosecuted. They are murderers. Makes a man like Ringo Doc, makes him do the things he does. A man like Ringo... Got a great empty hole right to the middle of him. He can never kill enough or steal enough or inflict enough pain to ever fill it. I've been reliably informed that he can fill it if you let him steal up to $950 worth of merchandise within a 24-hour period from Walgreens. Because last time I had a job, I was working up in the Taco Bell in Berkeley, and the manager told me, hey, Brian, it's closing time. We got to start mopping the floors, getting ready and stuff, you feel me? So I start throwing hands with him. In fact, you're probably seeing double. I have two guns, one for each of you. Doc's resourcefulness in compensating for his beer goggles with a gun in each hand dangerously implies that people with disabilities have to work harder to succeed in life's most pressing situations. Apparently he missed Marvel's Echo on Disney+, Plus, where freaking Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin was immediately defeated by a fat, deaf, amputee chick aided by nothing more than the validating spirits of our exclusively female Indian ancestors. Side Sheriff, I'm also tax collector, captain of the fire brigade, and chairman of the nonpartisan anti-Chinese league, ma'am. Actually, it was the Earp's friend, Mayor John Clum, who established the nonpartisan anti-Chinese league in Tombstone, which poses an insurmountable modern problem as he's portrayed sympathetically in the film. The only solution is to kill all the white guys, not just in the movie, and make a race slash gender swap reboot of Tombstone featuring non binary black lesbians, preferably written and produced by Leslie Headland, the lesbian former personal assistant of Harvey Weinstein, who is now heading up The Acolyte, the latest Disney Star Wars project on Disney Plus, which is also the first Star Wars property to have its official YouTube trailer receive not only a dislike ratio, but a more than three to one dislike ratio. But I will say I was always interested in female protagonists that were leaning toward the dark side of the force. And you're the devil. Good luck with that. Why? Do you believe in God? No, oh, come on, really, do you? Yeah, maybe. Hell, I don't know. Now, when asked whether or not one believes in God, there are only four possible answers. Yes, no, maybe, and hell, I don't know. Wyatt just gave three out of the four possible answers, which safely puts him in the agnostic community. However, Kevin Spacey was wrong, as the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing Darwinian Marxists that the upcoming judgment of God doesn't exist, and basically everyone in Hollywood works for Satan at this point, so Kurt Russell's disturbing lack of a definitive Oh, hell no. Along with rumors that he at least marginally supports the Second Amendment, means he needs to immediately be put into a FEMA camp. I was watching Fox News as I worked out this morning. Remember what I said about seeing a light when you're dying? Yeah. Yeah. Ain't true. I can't see a damn thing. I recently spoke with a blue-haired physical medium, admittedly an unusual occupation for a community predominated by Darwinian Marxists, who claimed to be in contact with both O.J. Simpson and Dexter Reed. They both related to her that they were, in fact, walking towards a bright light, and it was way hotter than they expected. Don't you mess around with him. Mark! One of the truest forms of masculinity is the familial bonds of brotherhood, and Wyatt's entire vendetta ride was driven by that. This presents a major problem for modern Hollywood because, you know... Put a chick in it! Make her gay! 
If we're gonna have a future in this town, it's gotta have some law and order. The phrase law and order was used as a campaign slogan in 2020 by President Donald Trump, so it's always been racist. And apparently we're doing just fine without it. Everybody throw free iPhones! Everybody must leave! Everybody must leave! Yes! The police, they either lock me up tonight! Why? It's just life. You get on with it. Don't know how. Sure you do. Say goodbye to me. Go grab that spirited actress and make her your own. Take that beauty and run. Don't look back. Live every second. Live right up the hill. for me. Why, if you ever my friend, if you ever had even the slightest feeling for me, leave now. Leave now. Please. Where are the non-binary black lesbians in this western? Much like True Grit and even 2012's Dread, there's something incredibly cathartic about stories where upholding the law moves from boring bureaucracy and into the realm of genuine avenging angels, and no movie pulls this off better than Tombstone. There are a ton of inconsistencies and embellishments in the historical accounts of what happened in Cochise County, Arizona in the 1880s, and half of the fun of Tombstone comes from the knowledge that the real events didn't play out as depicted and the filmmakers didn't care. They wanted to entertain the crap out of us, and they did exactly that, and they continue to do exactly that, and they managed to do it while still hitting a surprising number of real-life historical notes. Just don't count how many bullets stock fires without reloading at the OK Corral. Aside from the fun, Tombstone is also one of the few adaptations of White Earp's story that fairly accurately depicted the complex interplay of characters and allegiances, while finally balancing that with being a basic good versus evil story. Boomtowns didn't have time to differentiate the high end from the slums. Outlaws and lawmen were next door neighbors, and lawmen would deputize outlaws to arrest other lawmen. Whether you were arrested or deputized often came down to a simple matter of who you could claim as a friend that day. We often look back on people in history as good or bad, but it's pretty clear that those people didn't necessarily look at each other that way. It always makes me wonder how future generations will look back on each one of us, especially in a world where we leave so many digital records that are a lot easier to archive our life stories from. Who will we be remembered as? Curly Bill's killing of Fred White is believed to have been an accident, and the two men seem to have been friends. Sherman McMasters is reported to have shot at Virgil Earp at least one time before changing sides and joining Wyatt to avenge the attacks on his family. The truth is, regardless of how anyone's remembered based on a fraction of their full story, there's always going to be a lot of gray area between the White Hats and the Black Hats, and Tombstone makes this very clear on more than one occasion. Anyway, should Christ tarry, I'll see you in the next video. Jesus loves you. Vote Lane for King of Canada. The westernization of Chinese food is proof that God's favor shines upon cultural appropriation. And let's make movies great again. Put him on the endangered species list. Come on, man.